everybody, and welcome to Chapter 2, The Research Enterprise in Psychology, otherwise known as Research Methods in Psychology. So for today's objective, we have just one, and this is from the syllabus. We are going to compare and contrast research methods in psychology. And then for our outline, we are going to start off by discussing how the scientific method is applied to psychological research. We are going to define the, the terms theory, hypothesis, and operational definition. We are going to discuss the cycle of psychological research. And then we are going to define different research designs. So we're going to talk about the strengths and weaknesses of each design. And let's get into it. All right, so using the scientific method. So let's start off by talking about the goals of research. Uh, so with regard to psychology specifically, one goal of research is to find patterns in human behavior. Based on those patterns, we want to be able to make predictions. For instance, if you are studying college success, researchers may look at things like a person's socioeconomic status, uh, whether they went to public or a private high school, what their parents' highest levels of education are. They can look at SAT scores. So they want to find patterns with regard to uh, people's educational background and otherwise to figure out what makes a good, a quote-unquote good college student. What makes somebody successful in college, meaning they graduate and they get you know the, either the certificate or the degree that they signed up for. We also want to apply patterns and behavior to real world situations. Again, you know, we want to make sure that we're making predictions that have like an actual good practical use. Uh, so when it comes to student success, we can keep using that as an example. We want to be able to have tangible evidence that students are doing well. So okay, we put students in SAT prep classes, so we predict that an SAT prep class is going to help them get a good score on the SATs, so we want to be able to see if that is in fact the case, um, because the SAT is still a test that lots of students take, and it is something that many colleges take under consideration when um, making their decisions for who they are going to admit into the school. We also want to form a theory, so part of research is forming theories based on these patterns that we're observing. A theory is a system of interrelated ideas used to explain a set of observations. So again, if we are looking at college success, we may have some theory that kind of ties together all of the information that we've gathered from studies. So we've done a dozen studies, we've found these patterns in the behavior, so uh, we come up with a theory. All right, so the steps in a scientific investigation. First up, we want to form a hypothesis. And I have, a hypothesis is, in a nutshell, an educated guess about what we expect to happen. So sticking with our college success example, we might hypothesize or predict that students who have a high GPA in high school and who perform well on the SAT, that they will perform well in their college courses and they will go on to graduate. So that's the relationship. We think high scores in high school translate to high scores in college. Our hypothesis should always, regardless of what the study is about, be testable and falsifiable. Uh, meaning we don't want to just come up with an opinion. You know, if we were like, hey, if college or if high school students, if if Students are good in high school, they're going to be good in college. We've got to like put more, more meat on the bones there because uh, we don't want to just have an opinion. We want to have something that we can then take to the laboratory and test to see if we're, if we're right or not. And then falsifiable meaning, same thing. We want to be able to test it and maybe there is a scenario or some scenarios where our hypothesis isn't correct, um, but we want to kind of lay it all out in the open so that we are... Um, being honest about our research and that um, we were able to share ideas and that the data that we are gathering from our research is valid. 
We also need to create operational definitions of the variables. So what does that mean? Uh, so operational definitions are just very specific, concrete, testable ways of defining a behavior. So how might you, as a researcher, operationalize something like attractiveness? So a lot of times in psychology, we are trying to study in the most scientific way possible human behavior or emotions or thought patterns. So a lot of times we have these kind of intangible abstract ideas that we're trying to study. Something like attractiveness. It doesn't mean the same thing to everybody. So we would have to come up with an operational definition. If attractiveness is a component in our study, we have to figure out what the heck that means. So something you could do would be to uh, show pictures of individuals to a lot of people and have everybody rank how attractive they think they are on a scale of like 1 to 10. And then so you may deem the people who have scored an 8 to 10 as like highly attractive people. Um, that sounds really messed up, but it has been the subject of many studies in the past. It's just something that if you're going to use it, um, if there's a reason for you to study attractiveness, you have to tell your, I mean, you yourself as a researcher, you have to know exactly what you mean by that. And you have to tell your audience and other researchers that may read about your study, you have to tell them exactly what you meant by it. How might you operationalize happiness? So you could operationalize happiness by defining it as how many times a person smiles per hour or how many positive comments they say to coworkers if you're looking at like happiness in the workplace. How might you operationalize sadness? Sadness, pretty much the same thing. You could do the number of times somebody frowns or how many times they say negative comments. You could also give people some kind of survey, questionnaire. So we can look at thoughts and attitudes by just like asking people questions. We can look at behavior, so overt behavior like facial expressions, body posture, things that people are actually saying. Uh, so we've got lots of ways to operationally define our constructs or our topics in research. And it's all just going to depend on how exactly you want to study it and what exactly you're studying. All right, so this is the satisfaction with life scale. This is like a well-known and an often used instrument. It's short and sweet, as you can see. So there are five statements. You just rate each one on a scale of one to seven with one being I highly disagree and seven being I highly agree. And you would just rate how you feel about each of the statements. So the first statement, in most ways, my life is close to my ideal. The conditions of my life are excellent. I am satisfied with my life. So far, I've gotten the important things I want in life. And then finally, if I could live my life over, I would change almost nothing. So just one to seven, how much you disagree or agree with those statements, and then you add up your your points for each of the five statements and that's it, you have your overall score. Uh, so here on the right side of the screen, I have the rating. So if you get, if you score 31 to 35, you would be deemed extremely satisfied with your life. Now, obviously this is a simple scale and this may not be the be all end all to figure out how satisfied people are with their lives, but this could be one tool in a researcher's arsenal that they can, help gauge for things like, say, depression. Uh, so typically, if people are, um, are clinically depressed or if they are experiencing symptoms of depression or if they are experiencing a depressive episode, uh, things like um, hopelessness set in, um, feelings of guilt and feeling just like you haven't done enough. So somebody who is in a deep depression may score very low on this scale. So it could just be, again, one of many tools used by a researcher to kind of like figure out what's going on with a person. But this would be one way that we can operationalize life satisfaction. All right, continuing with our steps in a scientific investigation, the second step we have is to design the study. 
So once we've figured out what our research question or our, our hypothesis is, and we figured out how we're actually defining our variables, now we're going to get to how exactly we are going to carry out the study. There's a lot going on in the design of the study part, so we're just going to kind of keep this short and sweet. Uh, then the third step is we are going to collect the data. So design your study and then implement your study. And then once we've collected data, so be that if you know, you're know you doing like a true experiment, which we'll talk about momentarily, or if you're going to give a survey, um, just collect all the data you're going to you're going to collect and then analyze it and draw conclusions based on what the data is telling you. So some things we want to look at when we analyze our data is to look at whether or not our hypothesis was supported. So going back to our college success example, did we actually find out that folks who had a high GPA in high school and people who had high SAT scores are they actually doing well in college compared to people who maybe scored low on those things? If we did not support our, our hypothesis, could there be something wrong with the design? So maybe we didn't clearly define high SAT scores enough. Maybe we didn't define GPA enough. Maybe we didn't gather enough data. Maybe we didn't look at enough people. So there are lots of things that we can consider. Um, so just to give you guys the rough idea, when you go on to read scientific journal articles, which you'll do for this class, you will find, or you should find, if it's from a reputable journal, uh, the researchers talking about maybe what they could have done differently. Um, if they, these conditions were met, then maybe we would have seen significant results. Maybe our, our hypothesis was, well, it would have been supported. Maybe it was really close, but the data doesn't reveal it. Yeah. You know, so there are lots of what ifs going on. A lot of times once you design a study and then you carry it out, you learn along the way things that maybe like you didn't think about going into it. And then as you're carrying it out, you're like, oh, I could have done this better or differently. Then we are going to report the findings. So this could mean just reporting it to your professor for an assignment in class, or it could be publishing your results in a scientific journal. One thing that happens, um, actually sometimes at the college level, is you will undergo peer review. So sometimes professors will have you read each other's papers, so read the papers of other students so that you can critique it, or the peer review is kind of built into group assignments as well. Uh, but peer review is something that happens for scientific journals. It's something that happens where um, they'll have a panel of people reviewing it and they'll select reviewers from different disciplines. So they won't all be in psychology if it's a psychology paper. They may have people who are involved in anthropology, someone who has a background in math, somebody who has a background in English even. So they just have to be people who have like really impressive educational backgrounds, but in varied studies because they want somebody, if you have, for instance, if you're taking intro to psychology and you are looking for an article to summarize for the written assignment for this class, you may not be a psychology major. This is an intro class. So I get lots of students who are studying other disciplines or who are undecided, but say you're an English major or you're a nursing major, uh, you still should be able to have a, a pretty decent grasp on the, um, the research articles that are out there that are available to you on a variety of topics. So we want to make sure that people from various backgrounds are taking a critical look at the research design to make sure it was vigorous. So this is just a screenshot of, of a random journal article that I found via our school's library website. So here we have the title of the article. We've got the researchers' names, where they go to school or where they um, study. Um, so these people may be, um, may be professors, they may be grad students, they may have their PhDs and they're doing a postdoc, so they could be any any number of titles. Um, and then what we have here is called an abstract, so it's basically like a snapshot or a summary of what the article's about. And that's helpful because if you're looking for articles on a particular topic, that way you can read through this relatively short abstract, see if you understand what the article's about, 
see if it's related to your topic. All right, so now let's talk about experimental research. So this is one of the types of research designs that you may choose. So some elements of the experiment. Um, so first off, an experiment involves labeling variables, assigning participants to conditions, and recording changes in a variable or multiple variables. So the thing to know about experiments is there's a lot of control happening. They're very rigid, very structured. You want to have as much control over your participants or subjects as possible. Um, and I will say that I will use participants and subjects interchangeably. That kind of depends on what the research design is like, which determines if it's a participant or a subject. Um, but we won't really, for the purposes of this class, make a distinction. So for an experiment, we want to find a cause and effect relationship between our variables. So for instance, does X affect Y? So in our college success study, we may want to find out, well, does having a high GPA in high school and doing well in the SAT, does that cause you to do well in college? The short answer for that is not necessarily it's complicated. <laughs> we'll come back to that. Uh, so the independent variable, or X, is the thing that is being controlled. Um, so one of the reasons we couldn't really do an experiment on college success is because we don't know, like, you can't control how someone's going to do on their SAT or what their high school GPA is going to be. The dependent variable is the thing that's being affected. So let's try to make this college success example into an experiment. So maybe we'll dial it back. We'll just look at the SAT. So if we're trying to figure out whether an SAT prep class works, we would assign our participants to different conditions. So we'll have some students that don't get the SAT prep class and we'll have other ones that do get the prep class. So the thing that we are in control of is whether or not these students are enrolled in this prep class. Our dependent variable then would be their score on the SAT. So we'll figure out, does this prep course really work for most students who enroll in it? All right, so continuing with elements of the experiment, our experimental, our experimental group is our group of participants that receive a treatment. Now, treatment doesn't necessarily just mean medicine. Um, in our college success example, it could just be the SAT prep course. So they receive something special. The control group is a group of participants who don't receive the treatment. So in our example, the students who do not take the SAT prep course. And if we're going to look at uh, clinical trials for like medication, so the control group would be participants who don't receive any medication. The experimental group are the participants who are receiving the medicine that is being studied. It is very important for us to have random assignment when it comes to selecting which students are going to be, or sorry, students, well, in our example, students, uh, which participants are going to be in the control group and which participants are going to be in the experimental group or groups. We may have multiple experimental groups. Say, for instance, there are three college, or sorry, SAT prep courses out there. We may have four groups. So we have a control group. We have a group that is taking SAT prep course A, SA, another group taking SAT prep course B, and another group taking SAT prep course C. Uh, so, But we want to make sure that we're randomly assigning students to those conditions um, because we don't want to risk having some kind of bias. We don't want there to be a pattern in who we assign to each class. So draw names out of a hat or use a computer program or an app to randomly assign students to each of the SAT prep course groups. And that's a way for us to try to control for differences in people, right? We don't want to send like only female students or only male students, or um, maybe some of the students are like 15 and some of them are 17. So we don't want to, we want to try to account for age differences, differences in maybe socioeconomic status, differences in ethnicity, gender, 
all kinds of things. So we want to just make it as random as possible so that we can minimize those differences. And all the groups should be about the same. Again, random assignment helps with that, um, but also we want to maybe cap it so that we have roughly equal groups. Ideally, we would like e an equal number of students in each SAT prep situation. Okay, uh, so this is something if you are taking this class synchronously, meaning you take it at a particular time and we are logged into Zoom, um, then you would be getting with your breakout groups now. If not, you can just take this individually, just mull it over, or if you have a study buddy, work on it with your study buddy. Participants suffering from depression are assigned to three different therapy conditions. At the end of the experiment, participants are re-evaluated for level of depression. So, what is the independent, independent variable, or IV? What's the dependent variable, or DV? If you are taking this class asynchronously, meaning you're watching this at your own pace, go ahead and pause the video if you like. All right, moving on to question number two. How would you assign participants to conditions? Again, you can pause the video. All right, and then also, would you have a control group? So the independent variable here, what would that be? So that would be the experimental groups. So that would be the three different therapy conditions. So we've got therapy A, therapy B, and therapy C. So the type of therapy that is being used for treatment would be the independent variable. That's the thing that we have control over as researchers. At the end of the experiment, participants are re-evaluated for level of depression. So the dependent variable or the thing being measured, or in this case evaluated, would be level of depression. All right, and then how might you go about assigning participants to conditions? Again, the best way that we can go about this is random assignment. So we don't want to have some kind of background bias that's at the back of our head that we're not consciously aware of. We don't want that to impact who we assign to each condition. And why make it harder? Just do random assignment. And then that way your results will be valid. Um, other researchers who look at your work won't have have any like cause to question how you assign people to groups and just say it's random assignment. And then would you have a control group? So technically, in order for this to be a true experiment, we would need a control group. We basically have to have like a, um, a control or like a baseline to compare our results to. Sure, therapy condition A may be doing better for participants in terms of lowering their levels of depression than therapy B and C, but is it really doing much more than just people who are not currently in therapy? So we want to make sure we have that point of reference or that point of comparison via a control group. All right. So that was experimentation. We'll come back to that in a little while because we're going to talk about some of the strengths and weaknesses of that design. Other research designs include correlation, naturalistic observation, case studies, and surveys. All right, so first, correlation. Correlations help us determine a relationship between variables, which is, I mean, well, it's what we're trying to do in an experiment, but here's how it's different. Correlations can be positive or negative. So here I have uh, some examples. So on the left, we have a positive correlation. So if our variables are X and Y, they are rising at the same time. So if X is a high value, Y is also a high value. Same with the opposite. If X is a very low value, Y will be a very low value as well. The middle one, we've got no correlation. So those dots are data points and there is no rhyme or reason to them. There is no relationship between them. So that would be just straight up no correlation. And then on the right, we have a negative correlation. So as you can see here, this being our X axis, as X is getting bigger, or backwards, Y axis, this is our X axis. 
I remember math. <laughs> All right, so as y is getting bigger, x is falling. And same thing here, as x is getting bigger, we've got a downward slope here. So our y value down here is lower than it is up here when x is small. So that just means they have like an opposite relationship. They're doing the opposite things. But both positive and negative relationships are still relationships. They don't mean good or bad. It just talks about the direction. Strong correlations have a correlation coefficient or an R. So this little lowercase r, usually you'll see this italicized. Uh, so the Pearson R, um, if it's a really strong correlation, it'll be either very close to negative one or very close to positive one. You will never see a correlation that is negative 1.1 or positive 1.1. Those don't exist. Um, and really, in real life, in research, you will not find a perfect correlation. So you will not find a negative one or a positive one um, because it's just nearly impossible for us to have such perfect results in human behavior. So let's go back to our college success example. Really, we cannot look at SAT scores and high school GPA as anything but predictors of how well people will do in college because we can't force somebody to get a low GPA and we can't force somebody to completely bomb the SAT. That would just be unethical. So what we could do instead is look at, is there a relationship between them? So if there's a positive correlation, so here, that means that as SAT scores and high school GPA get higher, so does the possibility that people will perform well in their college classes and go on to graduate. For a negative correlation, which we would not expect to find, that would be as SAT scores get higher, college success drops. We wouldn't expect somebody to like just completely rock the SAT, just be like valedictorian at their high school, and then not do well at all in college. Obviously, there's some extreme circumstances that could cause somebody to um, to drop in performance in college. Um, possibly very like traumatic things or things like that. But in general, the general pattern in human behavior is that if you do really well in high school, you're probably going to do pretty well in, in college. All right, so some practice. Which correlation is stronger? Keep in mind that if we're getting close to negative one, it's strong. If we're getting close to positive one, it's strong. So imagine a number line with zero in the middle. If you're close to that zero, you're not going to have a strong correlation. All right, so let's go back. So negative 0.67 or negative 0.77. So the answer here would be negative 0.77 because that is closer to negative one than 0.67 is to positive one. Negative one or one? Trick question there, the answer is they're the same. They're both perfect correlations. One is just negative because of what the variables are doing in relation to each other. Um, and one is positive, again, just based on the relationship. Negative 0.92 or positive 0.89? So that one would be negative 0.92. That is slightly stronger than a positive 0 0.89. 0 0.23 or 0.54. So in this case, they're both positive. So the bigger one wins. 0.54 is the stronger correlation. All right. Naturalistic observation. So we're moving away from correlations now, moving on to naturalistic observation. Naturalistic observation is pretty straightforward. It's when you study subjects in their normal environment without interacting with them. So this is one of those cases where I would say subjects instead of participants, um, because usually the people or the animals that are studied don't necessarily know that they're being observed. So they're kind of a subject, you know, they're, it's like a, a more passive term. So for instance, Jane Goodall studying her chimps in the wild. Um, obviously, this is not the best example picture-wise, uh, just because she did end up interacting with them. And in this picture, she's obviously pretty close 
to her research subjects, but typically you want to study them without them knowing that they're being observed. So you could possibly um, say, for instance, you are a teacher or maybe a school psychologist. You may want to try to observe what students at the school that you work at, what they're doing during recess or playtime. Maybe you're looking for aggressive behavior. So you could be kind of watching them from the sidelines. Um, but you're doing so in a normal environment for them and hopefully without interacting with them or without going noticed. All right, moving on to case studies, another research method. Case studies are very in-depth studies of an individual. They can last a very long time. So this is a picture of Jeannie. She was a young girl who was found at the age of 12. Uh, she was found um, extremely malnourished. She was very small for her age. She couldn't talk. Uh, she just like couldn't form words not because of any anything that happened to her like at birth or anything that was neurologically wrong with her, but she was severely neglected by her parents. She was strapped to a high chair for most of her life and she just she didn't get the interaction and the enrichment that she needed to flourish. Uh, so Jeannie is one example of a case study. She was studied for several years um, because once she was found, she was taken into foster care and researchers who were very, um, very hands-on with her care, uh, were interested in studying like why it was that she couldn't speak. Case studies are typically used by clinical psychologists. It's typically, oh, sorry, let me go back. Uh, typically used to study in like rare and unique situations. So with Jeannie, it was, um, sure there are other children, unfortunately, who are neglected, but her case was so severe that it provided researchers with a lot of information about language and how we form language and the fact that there's a critical period. So it's like at a certain point, if you don't use it, you lose it. So we lose the ability to really grasp the intricacies of language. Uh, so psychologists use individuals, uh, it sounds really bad, but um, they study individuals with rare and unique disorders or, you know, like the, the disorder is so severe. Um, there's a lot of research with like memory impairments, which we'll talk more about when we get to chapter seven on memory. All right, then we have surveys. A survey, which many of you have taken, I'm sure. I'm kind of, uh, I'm a little bit of a nerd when it comes to surveys. I often take surveys. Like if I get an email about a survey, um, like Disneyland offers me a survey, or if I get a survey about like my, uh, like the level of service that I get at like Target or Costco or something, I always like feel inclined to take them. Uh, but anyway, administering questionnaires or interviews to gather information. Uh, so typically the surveys that we see nowadays um, aren't really interviews. Usually they're not like face-to-face. -face. A lot of times they're just administered online. Some things that we can look at for surveys is we can look at attitudes, beliefs, behavior. So it's kind of wide open. Um, but basically surveys give us a chance to ask questions about behaviors, attitudes, beliefs that wouldn't be readily apparent. So like if you're going to ask somebody about their musical taste, you know, there's no guarantee that people that you're asking are going to be wearing a band shirt or, you know, have a sticker on their car that indicates what bands they're into. So you may have to ask people. Uh, same thing with like attitudes, like if it comes to politics, not everyone's going to run around wearing a shirt or having a bumper sticker for their favorite political candidate. Um, I mean, often you do see some outward displays of, of a preference, but not everybody's the same. So a lot of times we just have to ask people about it. When it comes to behavior, we may ask people about things that would be really unethical for us to try to observe in a naturalistic setting or something that may be unethical for us to experiment on. So for instance, we can ask people about their sexual behaviors because it's probably going to be one of the easiest ways for us to get information. We can also look at trends. 
So trends in attitudes, trends in behavior even. So we can have an overlap of any of these things. So here's one that's a little bit older now, um, but this is looking at the percentage of U.S. adults versus U.S. teens who say they go online and how often they go online. So we've got in the darker blue bars, we have teens aged 13 to 17. And in this lighter blue, we have adults who are 18 and over. So in this survey, they just asked people, would you say you are online almost constantly, several times a day, less often, or not at all? So in this study, they found that adults are more likely to say not at all. They didn't have anybody in the teen category who said they're never online. Um, we've got more adults saying less often, about the same adults and teens saying several times a day. And then we've got a lot more teens saying that they are online almost constantly compared to adults. All right, so let's look at the pros and cons of each research method. So for experiments, some of the pros, so the positive things, we can minimize the effects of extraneous variables, which basically means that we have so much control so we can kind of filter out other variables that could be impacting our study. Uh, so for instance, if we are going to look at the SAT prep classes, we can make it so that we know maybe we're prescribing how long each student is studying. So the class is X many hours per day. Um, they're supposed to study this length of time. We can do all kinds of things to try to, you know, restrict their behavior as much as possible. And then another pro is that it can give us a cause and effect relationship. In fact, experiments are the only research design out there that can give us a cause and effect relationship where we can say X is causing Y. Um, and we can say it depending on how strong our data are and the statistics that we run. We can say it with a high degree of certainty that we know that this SAT prep class is leading to success in terms of a high SAT score. Some of the cons of experimentation are that they lack ecological validity. And what that means, um, ecological means like basically real world. It doesn't look like the real world. And often in experiments, it doesn't look like the real world. Because the, the toss up there is we have so much control and in the real world, we wouldn't be in control of people's behaviors. So it can often cause a pretty artificial feeling to it. So we've got like forced responses when in reality, human behavior is more complex. And again, we don't have control over it. Another limitation is, uh, is ethics. So we've got limited topics that we could study with experiments. Now, there are plenty of creative ways to design experiments for any number of topics. But when it comes to, say, for instance, things like sexual behavior, it's kind of hard for us to experiment on that. We can't do that without being weird and creepy. So we've got some drawbacks there. With correlation, uh, correlations can help make predictions about behavior. Again, going back to SAT scores and high school GPA. Uh, if those are high, we can try to predict how well people will do in college. And in reality, it's like a modest correlation. I think it's like 0.65 or something. So it's not the greatest correlation. Uh, another positive is that it could be a good first step in the research process. So even if we want to do an experiment, like if, if that's the goal is to do an experiment, we can run correlational research so that we have a jumping off point. So we can figure out, is there a relationship between these variables or not? And if it seems like there is a pretty strong relationship, then we can say, okay, now this is how we're going to design the experiment. And so basically the correlational research is a jumping off point. Some cons, well, the one major drawback of correlational research is it does not give us a cause and effect relationship. Correlation does not imply causation. So just because there's a relationship doesn't mean X causes Y or even that Y causes X. I'm going to use the same tired explanation um, or example of ice cream sales and crime. So there is a study that found that 
ice cream sales and crime are both high at the same time. Like, so a lot of ice cream sales, lots of crimes happening. Um, but the thing is, you can't say one is causing the other because you just know that they are related to each other. And please forgive my psycho dog barking and growling in the background. All right. So then with naturalistic observation, one of the advantages is we have high ecological validity. So since we are studying subjects in their natural environment, it looks like the real world, at least the real world to them. Another positive is that it could be a good first step in the research process. So going back to studying children, let's say elementary age children, and if you're looking at aggress uh, aggression, aggressive behaviors on the playground, a naturalistic observation to kind of get an idea of what's going on could be a good jumping off point. And then from there, you may design something else. It could be an experiment. One of the drawbacks is reactivity. So when people or animals know that they are being watched, they may start to change their behavior. So going back to children on a playground, if they know the principals out there watching them or if they know the school psychologist or even their teachers out there watching them, they might be on their best behavior. Also, the opposite could happen. They could be on their worst behavior because they're kind of just like acting up and showing off. So we've got the possible issue with reactivity. For case studies, one of the advantages is that lots of information is gathered, like a lot. So you would probably have historical information about the subject. So you would know their date of birth, where they were born, who their parents are, if their parents are in the picture, what they did for work, what their highest level of education is. You know where this person went to school. You know a lot about them. You could even have access to medical records because if this is an authorized case study, then a lot of times it's because there's there's kind of like a grave situation that warrants researchers having information to this sensitive personal information. So lots and lots of information is gathered through case studies. Also with case studies, you have uh, researchers can be running diagnostic tests on their um, on their subjects. So they could be giving them intelligence tests, they could be giving them like personality inventories, they could be trying to measure them for levels of depression and other things. So all kinds of things going on plus clinical interviews where the researcher talks to the subject at length. So we've got lots of things going on. The drawback is that the information may not be generalizable to other subjects, meaning it just doesn't always fit the case for quote unquote normal human behavior. Because in the case of Jeannie, yes, we learned a lot about language, language acquisition specifically, but that doesn't necessarily help tell us how children acquire language. It just showed that she went too long without interaction and she couldn't learn it at that point. All right, for surveys, lots of pros for surveys. They're quick, they're cheap, and they're easy to administer, especially nowadays. We have online surveys. Um, if you are a student, you typically have, uh, have access to the free version of Qualtrics, which is an online program that you can use to design questionnaires. They don't even have to necessarily be for true surveys. You can actually design a questionnaire that's used for an experiment. Um, but there's lots of functionality for Qualtrics, and I'm sure you will all at some point in your academic career come across Qualtrics. Um, and then you just send your survey link to people online, and then lots of people are able to take it. Another pro is that you can gather lots of information in a short amount of time. So again, if it's an online survey, you could just send the link to people, hundreds, thousands of people, um, depending on obviously what it is that you're trying to do or what your research pool looks like. So lots of pros to surveys, but some cons are things like social desirability. So that means that a person may be answering the way they think the researcher wants them to answer or just in a way that's going to be acceptable. So, for instance, you may have somebody answering a survey about aggression, and you could have an item on there that says something about them being aggressive or violent towards children or animals. People may not want to answer truthfully to that because the truth is sometimes ugly. 
So you've got that. So people may be, you know, just kind of making themselves look better than they are. Or just like with the reactivity with the school age children, you could have some people who are just like trying to show off and shock people. So they may not, they may go the complete opposite way. Then you have things like memory errors. So if you were to ask somebody, um, like somebody who's in their 30s, how much how much TV they watched as children, like to quantify it, like how many hours per day did you watch TV? That was a long time ago. That's really hard to remember something that happened not long ago. So they may feel like they watch TV all the time because maybe they were, you know, had their, their favorite shows and they remember spending a lot of time with that. So maybe that inflates um, or exaggerates the amount of time that they spent watching TV. Or you could have kind of a combo social desirability and memory error where they're like, I never watch TV. But in reality, they watch TV four hours a day. You can also have people misunderstanding your questions. So it could just be because you worded it in a way that doesn't really click to people. So either they have no idea what you're talking about or you could have something that phrased you like you designed the question so you know what you meant. But somebody else may think they know what you meant and they completely got it wrong according to where you were going with it. Um, That happens on exams. You know, sometimes I have students who are like, oh, I read your test question and I took it to mean this. So sometimes that happens. You could also have um, have a scenario where uh, some of the people taking your exam or not your exam, your survey are maybe non-native English speakers. So maybe there are some phrases that are a little bit weird when you translate it into another language. So there could be lots of reasons that somebody misunderstands what the survey is asking. All right, so let's talk about types of bias and the placebo effect. So these all fall under the umbrella of evaluating research. So going back to that idea of peer review, if you were to critically look at somebody's research, these are some things that you may look for. Um, Also, a little bit harder to do it for yourself, but you should also, throughout the research process, self-reflect and be critical of your own methods. All right. So this group of folks is our population. So it is the large group that researchers are interested in making generalizations about. So again, we want to find patterns in behavior or generalizations that we can make about people. So our population could be U.S. adults. So that would be anybody in the U.S. over the age of 18. Our sample, however, is the group of people or participants that are selected for a study. So unless you have crazy funding for your research, you probably won't be able to survey or experiment on every adult in the US. And even if you had unlimited funds for your research, you cannot guarantee that everybody is gonna wanna take part of your study. So we have to settle for a sample. So if we're looking at this crowd of people, I know this circle is not the best because I'm kind of cutting off this person's head just a little bit. And then it's like, well, does this torso belong in this group? Um, But bear with me. So I think hopefully you get the idea that we settle for if, if our population is a hundred thousand people, we may have to settle for a pot or a sample size of a hundred or 200 or 300. So it really just depends on the type of study that we are conducting. All right, so on to experimenter bias and placebo effects. Researchers' expectations or preconceived notions influence study outcome. We don't want that to happen. Um, But unfortunately, it does happen many times. If you expect to have your hypothesis supported, like obviously you come up with a hypothesis because you believe that's what the relationship between your variables is going to be. But we have to try to prevent that as much as possible. Placebo is a fake treatment. So placebo is easiest described as a fake drug. So when it comes to clinical trials for medications, it would be a sugar pill. It's, you know, there's no active ingredient in it that's going to influence human behavior whatsoever. But you could be creative and a placebo could be any number of things. You could tell somebody 
that saying their name, your own name, three times in a mirror, <laughs> so kind of like Candyman or Bloody Mary, <laughs> or kind of like Beetlejuice, minus the mirror, um, you could say that saying your name three times in a mirror before you take a test is going to help your performance on the test. That is not grounded in any kind of reality, any kind of research evidence, not that I know of anyway, because I just made it up. So that could be a placebo as well. It's just a treatment that does not work, that has no effect. That's what it is. So again, an example could be a sugar pill. The placebo effect is when participants exhibit change in their behavior or the dependent variable despite having a, pl a placebo. So like my mirror example, if I say my name three times in the mirror, if I just say Jessica, Jessica, Jessica in the mirror three times before I take my exam, there could be a chance that I do start to do better on my exams. Um, but that would be like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Maybe just I've, I've done something that I think is going to help me. So my belief in that might actually elevate my performance. Just gives me this extra little boost of confidence to do well in my exam. And sometimes that happens with clinical trials. Oftentimes people expect pills or vitamins or treatments. They expect them to work. So it may, may kind of like warp your perception of what's going on. So if you're taking, if you're in a clinical trial for an antidepressant, you don't know if you're getting a sugar pill or if you're getting the actual antidepressant, but the mere fact that you're taking medication, you may be like, yeah, I feel better. So I think that I'm taking the real drug. In order to combat this, a double blind procedure is best. So experimenters and subjects or participants don't know who is receiving the manipulations. So they don't know who's getting the real treatment and they don't know who's getting the fake one. So that way we have, even if people who are taking a placebo in the antidepressant trial, if they're taking a placebo, we would expect them to not be doing as well in terms of lowering their symptoms of depression than the people who are taking the antidepressant. And that's me, you know, just kind of basing it on if, if people were to develop an antidepressant, they probably think it works. <laughs> so... Um, so if your hypothesis is that this new drug will help lower symptoms of depression, then you would expect the people taking the antidepressant to do better than the people taking placebo, even if those people are experiencing a placebo effect. All right. So again, if you're taking this synchronously, this is the time to break in groups. If you are taking this course asynchronously, then... Take some time, maybe pause the video, maybe jot some things down and come back to it. Um, but look at the flaws in each research study. So study one, a researcher announces that he will be conducting an experiment to investigate the detrimental effects of sensory deprivation on perceptual motor coordination. The first 40 students who sign up serve in the control group. So first 40 students are in the control group. The researcher supervises all aspects of the study's execution. Experimental subjects spend two hours in a sensory deprivation chamber where sensory sti sti sorry, stimulation is minimal. Control subjects spend two hours in a waiting room that contains magazines and a TV. All subjects then perform 10 one-minute trials on a pursuit rotor task that requires them to try to keep up, I'm um, sorry, to try to keep a stylus on a tiny rotating target. So one of those little like fake pens that you use for a screen. The dependent variable is their average score on the pursuit rotor task. All right, so look at things like sampling bias, possibility of a placebo effect, distortions in self-reports, confounding of variables, which we didn't really talk about, but basically confounding of variables means that there could be other variables that are impacting the dependent variable or the results. So say, for instance, you were to take a test in a cold room versus a hot room. It could be that the temperature in the room is affecting your scores, or it could be that the people who took the class in the cold room took it at 6 a.m. and the people who took the test in a hot room took it at 6 p.m. 
So we could have a confounding variable with the time of day. And then look for experimenter bias. I'm not going to go over the analysis, but this is just kind of like a critical thinking exercise. All right, and then study two, a researcher wants to know whether there is a relationship between age and racial prejudice. She designs a survey in which respondents are asked to rate their prejudice against six different ethnic groups. She distributes the survey to over 500 people in uh, 500 people of various ages who are approached at a shopping mall in a low-income inner-city neighborhood. So think about that. All right, I will leave you with that. And then for the discussion forum, answer the following. One, what behavior would you be interested in studying? Try to be as specific as possible. So instead of saying like happiness, you could say, I'm interested in studying how happiness levels are related to anything, really. You could do something silly like happiness levels, uh, the relationship between happiness levels and watching RuPaul's Drag Race. You could do, I don't know, any number of things. <laughs> Be creative with that. And then also, which research methods would you choose and why? So it could just be one method. It could be multiple. As we discussed several slides ago, there is, um, you know, sometimes you might use like a correlational study to get a jump start and then to, um, and then do an experiment after. Um, you could do a mixed method design where you do multiple, um, multiple methods just to get all of the information that you want. How would you recruit your participants? So would you ask classmates? Would you just send a survey link online to your friends on Facebook? How would you recruit your participants? And think about it um, in terms of what we talked about in this lecture. Trying to be as like rigid and rigorous and scientific as possible. All right, and then respond to at least one other student. All right, that is all for now. Thanks for tuning in.